You're listening to That's Pretty Dark. The podcast where we talk about all of the entertainment that scared us as children and still haunts us as adults. So grab your flashlight and join us as we take a frightfully nostalgic look over our shoulders and under our beds and in our closets. And together we'll realize, whoa, that's pretty that's dark. Pretty dark. that I was going to say, and I was going to say not to be a neurodivergent Jerry Seinfeld about it, but I think I am a neurodivergent Jerry Seinfeld in my daily life to everyone around me. I mean, I feel like I'm Jerry Seinfeld every day, but yeah, neurodivergent. Specifically, because the things that I rant about are not things that you're probably going to relate to if you're neurotypical, but if you're not, you're going to go, ah, that's so true. (laughs) And the thing that I was, (laughs) I've been thinking about for months now is light bulbs. The light bulbs. Because. Exactly. I get to see. I was like, see Kramer just walk in and go, Jerry, light bulbs. Light bulbs. Yeah, light bulbs. But the thing is, when you are a neurodivergent person, the lighting in your space is very important, right? Like, that's just a thing, even if you're not, but especially if you are. Yeah. And I've been to hell, Hmm. and hell is the light bulb aisle at Lowe's or like a home repair, whatever store. I, I go to hell all the time. Yes, because I frequent hell. The names of the light bulbs never mean what you think they're going to mean. <laughs> no, they don't. It'll, it'll be like clean daylight. And you're like, okay, that's mm-hmm. what I f- with, clean daylight. And then you <laughs> buy clean daylight and you feel like you're in an emergency room or a yeah. hospital or yeah. an operating room. Feel I mean. super fluorescent. Yeah. So then you're like, well, that's not, I didn't actually want clean daylight. No, you daylight, never want I, daylight. It's way too bright. No, I don't. I don't. And you're right about that. But it's I. It's so bright. But my light bulbs, you see the problem and then where the neurodivergence especially comes in <laughs> is that the light bulbs burn out at undetermined and very lengthy periods of time. Yeah. Different periods of time. And it's always varied and you never know when it's going to happen. Are you buying... Are you buying... Single light bulbs um, at a time? No, no. It'll be like six or three or whatever, whatever is available to me at the time. And oftentimes what mm-hmm. I've noticed that I do now that I've lived in my house for four years and this is a pattern with me sure. is that I'll forget what the light bulbs were. So I buy like a three pack or whatever, the smaller <sighs> pack to be like, I'm not certain this is it. So I'm going <laughs> to test it. And then I do, but then I never go back and get the light bulbs because they're no longer imperative. <laughs> like I know I never go back and get a larger this is nuts. size. I mean, I know we have people who relate to this for sure. I mean, it took me a while to figure out the light bulb game in my house, but I'm pretty satisfied with where, where I've landed, but I've lived in my house for twice as long as you've lived in yours. So. True. Yeah. You've had more time to figure this out. I'm a, I'm a bit more enlightened. But I would also like to justify it by saying, if you will, the inhabitant, the person before me that owned this house yeah. put different bulbs with different and and i haven't even touched there's color but there's also wattage i just replaced all the light bulbs in my house when i moved in i should have done that but i didn't i I went ahead and updated so i'm i mean i was already way ahead of the curve i am not and the light bulbs in my fixtures several of them were of different color and wattage yeah so Mm -hmm. i got very used to in my head and i live in this house and i'm in this house 24-7 24-7 for the most part sure. at different varying times of the year, depending on how kind my um, day job is to me, allowing me to work from home. But I get very used to and very attached to the specific tone of the light yeah. in the room that I'm in. Yeah, the light feel. And then when one burns out, I don't know which it is. The atmosphere. I don't know which to replace. The ambiance. They're not, I kept, I kept the box the last time I bought a three-pack. I was like, I kept the box because I was like... Taking a picture is not going to be good enough. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have this box in my hand when I go back because I'm not going to do this to myself again. Yeah, you're going to match it. And they changed the names of them. (laughs) They just rebranded everything. Man, what a pickle you're in. And I'm never going to get out of it is the problem. (laughs) This is a cycle that's just too deep. I'm too deep in it now (laughs) to ever recover. That's all neurodivergence is, is just getting yourself stuck into cycles that are like maelstroms of just yeah. simple things that become maelstroms. Yeah. And they're, it's full overwhelm all the time. All the time. And you're like, I'll never escape. Yeah. I'll never get out of the maze. And that's I'll never survive. Spot on. Spot on description of what it's like to live in my head. And that's so. how I'm going to feel trying to edit the intro to this episode because <laughs> that has nothing to do with anything we're talking about. No, it doesn't. It <laughs> doesn't. Welcome to 2024, you know- everybody. <laughs> we're back from our hiatus. And it feels crazy. We're back and we have big feelings about light bulbs. Back to hearing Kaylin rant My name is Kaylin, about her yes. regular life. <laughs> I do the same on occasion. My name's Christian Mott. This is That's Pretty Dark. This is That's Pretty Dark. It's ironic that we're coming to you first with light bulb conversation. Hmm. 
although we're not talking about light bulbs today, the light and the colors do, and I thought about this last night, thank you very much. <laughs> Where are we? Do tie in to my light bulb story. What's even happening right now? I'll get you there. I promise. <laughs> okay. I can't wait. So <laughs> if, you could, if you couldn't tell by the title, we're talking today about Balto. Balto. The animated film. What a film. Watched it twice in the last 12 hours. As you should. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of glad that we're approaching Balto now at this point in our show because a lot of the key players in the stories that I will tell you today um, are now That's Pretty Dark alumni. That's true. It's also the dead of winter, so it feels very appropriate. Exactly. See, I planned it this way. Yeah. I planned for that at least. Of course. But we're going to talk about, you know, Amblimation, James Horner, our friend and writer, David Stephen Cohen. Mm -hmm. Our back catalog has become like a niche little education. <laughs> right. Really. Just as we've built on it over time. And I think that's cool. Not to mention even like Jim Cummings. He's in everything. Also true. He's an animated like vocal mm -hmm. voice artist king. And there are so many like that. There are so many talented, talented people like that that were in this melting pot of animation in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. Hopefully, listener, you have had time to catch up on the back catalog after the hiatus that we've just been on. Yeah, you didn't have enough time, <laughs> did you? But if you are just finding your flashlight, don't worry. I'll be the lead sled dog today <laughs> and I'll get you where you need to go. I'm just going to be literally, if you're the lead sled dog guiding us on our way, I'm the guy in the like sled. Yes. The musher. Um, yeah. The musher who's basically mm -hmm. knocked unconscious the whole time. Yes. <laughs> and like, I love. That works. We're not going to get to the movie yet today, but I love that like. When the dogs are just running the whole show, he's in the background, like half awake, half unconscious, going mm -hmm. like, good dog, mush, go, get us where <laughs> yeah. we need to go. And like, it's, it it's feels a like bit, a video game. It, oh, yes. I was going to say that too. Yeah. It feels like he's an NPC that's just yes. not re relevant. But exactly. it's also a powerful allegory for how we've spoken about how a lot of adult figures, parents, et cetera, are animated yep. mm -hmm. in the 80s and 90s. To be totally you know? like irrelevant players. Irrelevant to the plot. But yeah, you know? that's how I would have opened the show would have been to comment <laughs> on, I want a dog sled rescue video game. Oh, that'd be fun. Where each dog has their own health meter. Yes. You're navigating all these different like terrains obstacles. and territories and obstacles. Mm -hmm. it, it really kind of... Uh, hit home when they were in the ice cave. Yeah. And they were trying to escape the ice crystals. I mean, the icicles falling and everything. Mm, stalactites. Because he's in the background just like kind of talking. I want that in a game. Mm -hmm. I just want the guy to be unconscious and the whole game is a rescue mission. <laughs> the dog's getting him back to where he has to go. I agree with you about the film. And as as cool of a game as that would be. Be awesome. Everything I have to share with you today is going to tell you a little bit more about the mushers in the story. Yeah, I so. looked it up a little bit. Not <laughs> not the whole thing, but I wanted to be somewhat educated so I could contribute. But very different from the movie. Very different from the movie. I'm excited. As we will see. Tell us about it. Balto is loosely based on the true story surrounding the Gnome Serum Run of 1925. Yeah. Balto was produced by Steven Spielberg's animation company, Amblimation, as I said, and hit U.S. theaters in December of 1995. Oof. With the release coming just a month or so after Pixar's first release, which was Toy Story, wow. I would say that the box office, which was roughly $11.3 on a budget of over $30 million, mm. I would say that those numbers do not reflect the true staying power of this title. Yeah, I agree. It went on to have a really great home video run, which began in the spring of 1996, and uh, this success, which I myself owned at least two copies of this film on VHS, um, <laughs> spurred two direct-to-video sequels. Yeah, I saw that too. So the kids that liked it, liked it. The girls that got it, got it. Mm -hmm. As is the case with a lot of the films that we talk about on our show. At least they released it in December. Not like all these other movies that yeah. are releasing like in the mid-summer. It was seasonally appropriate. Makes no sense. Yes. And if we had done Gremlins, we would be doing three Spielberg movies in a row. I know. <laughs> I even kind of had it in my head that that would be a possibility because we would have already talked about a lot of Spielberg's like quirks and tendencies or like mm -hmm. things that he wanted to, you know, put in. Yeah. But he had his hand in just so many things back then. There's a reason. He is ubiquitous with the film industry. Yep. Okay, guys. It's been a while, so I am a little rusty. You too. <laughs> but I do think that it's summary time. Hit us with that summary. 
Balto, the fictional version, follows the titular character through hometown ridicule for being a half-breed. Half husky, half wolf, or half dog, yeah, half wolf. he's a wolf, wolf dog. Yeah. Right, which in my opinion, and apparently mine alone, makes for one hell of a dog in general. No, for I sure. I think that's really cool. I'm so surprised. I mean, I've always wanted a dog like that. I'm so surprised he Me was too. considered this like... I don't know, outcast. outcast mutt, like danger yeah. to society type, mongrel. Everybody hated him. Yeah. Um, can you hear Phoebe? I cannot. Are you okay? She's screaming. <laughs> she's mad about this. Not again. Yeah, she's I like, thought we're talking you were about dogs again? I thought this was over. Phoebe. Man, she was angry. But yeah, you would think a, um, a husky wolf mix would be the fastest dog in all the land. I know you would think this would be a coveted like gene pool, mm -hmm. but apparently I mean, not. apparently he is the fastest dog in the land. Right. So a bit unfair though, considering he started the race in the last, literally the home stretch we'll, and he we'll still won. There. We'll get there. It's unrealistic. <laughs> I can't believe this animated movie so far fetched. <laughs> You might have more qualms with it when we get to the end of this than you even think that you do now. So, for this vaguely racially charged reason, none of the townspeople or animals in the fictional representation of Nome, Alaska are fans of Balto, except for his father figure, a Russian goose named Boris, <laughs> yes. his two polar bear buddies, Muck and Luck, who are named after Arctic footwear, Oh wow! and a certain red husky named Jenna, which... Just heart eye emojis all over uh, Jenna, that. Jenna uh, might be her red coat, but she's pretty foxy. <laughs> I knew you were going to make She's hot. I don't know how I knew, but I knew that you had a joke like that. She's hot. Well, everybody was crushing on Balto, too. So I'm sure. These I'm are sure. The, uh, these are the childlike eyes with which we watched this. I mean, their, their little comments, their little innuendos back and forth mm -hmm. were not helping either. No, not at all. Or they were. <laughs> But again, we're getting ahead of ourselves. We're just Depends too excited. Depends on your perspective. We're just eager sled team ready to hit the snow because this is a good we're one. We're just ready to prove ourselves, ready to get out there and just show them what we're made of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so as you said, now taking us five minutes to get through the summary, Balto proves himself the fastest pup in the land. I literally phrased it that way. Mm -hmm. And when a diphtheria outbreak threatens the children of Nome through a series of unfortunate events, icy weather, and a lesser sled dog's prideful mistakes, looking at you, Steel, Steel. he becomes the town's only hope. A series of unfortunate events. Yes. Nice. Balto as a film was formative for me in so many ways, which is probably pretty surprising to all of you being a girl from Alabama. <laughs> Uh, but the icy hues, the soaring score, and the distinct hope found within still give me flashbacks. Even watching the opening credits recently, I got a little bit choked up because I know how many times baby Kaylin stood at the VCR at the TV, just endless, endlessly rewinding this tape and rewinding until I saw those frames. <laughs> and I would stop rewinding and watch it again, you know? Oh, it's pretty cute. Mm. I think Balto, like all dogs, hit harder for me than most because not only was I obsessed with animals as a child, especially dogs and wolves, mm -hmm. as we've discussed before. I was going to say, talking animals, yeah, this checks out for thing. you. Yeah. It was a thing for me, but it was also the health anxiety mm -hmm. aspect. Right. I think I've told you before, the first story that I ever wrote was about a wolf in part thanks to Balto. Yeah. And I got a tattoo of a wolf on my rib cage many years ago for that same reason. Because it's always been a symbol of like independence and some type of story, some sort of resourcefulness. Like, yeah, I guess resourcefulness is a good way to put it. But like there's a story here. There's something sure. to tell. There's something yeah. worthwhile. I don't know why, but that's how it came to be symbolized in my mind. There's a lot of romance to wolves. Yeah, there is. And I'm, of course, always a sucker for the underdog. The underwolf, I mean. Um, the underdog within the wolf. And then it also helps that he was providing, you know, hope to these sick little kids because I've been in that position in my life many more times than I would like to have been. Yeah. So I think I also looked at him as like heroic for saving those children. But like knowing that there was a hero like Balto out there yeah. is a very comforting thought when you are a child who is sick right. a lot. That makes a lot of sense. So today we will explore the triumphant, if dark, story that the film is based on. Uh, because I'm sure if you don't already know, you have always wondered about it. Yeah, yeah. And we will also talk about the similarly triumphant production tale. And then next time, we will round out our discussion of the cast and crew and recap some of the film's most impactful moments, some that live on with us nearly 30 years later. Yeah, I'd always heard that it was based on a true story. And that very much surprised me because I was thinking, how do you get this crazy story about these dogs from a true story? <laughs> 
And I was like, sure. Oh, well, you just uh, fabricate like all of it. Exactly. When you make it up, <laughs> that's how you just you just create use it as characters loose... and change everything, and then it plays. Exactly. And that's precisely what we're about to go into today. Yeah. I would advise you, darklings, to get your blankets and your hot tea oh. and cozy up, because. It all started in the winter of 1924 and 1925, mm. which cue my gasp when I realize it's been almost 100 years exactly, when Nome, Alaska did begin to see symptoms of the deadly infection wow. bacteria. It is 100 years. Mm -hmm. In oh December. December of 2024 will be 100 years. Well, then why are we doing this next year? What's happening? <laughs> I didn't realize it would be the centennial. <laughs> I didn't. We've ruined everything. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I've just wanted to do it so badly. I kept telling myself, in the winter, I'll do Balto. In yeah, the winter, I'll yeah. do Balto. <laughs> Historically speaking, the serum run of 1925 is something that I've wondered about and only heard pieces of for decades. So I am excited to share this somewhat abridged but mostly complete story with like-minded darklings. But I do have to warn you, as you were saying, mm -hmm. the historical story and the film are a lot more like cousins than sisters. Right. The creators of Balto did painstaking research not only into the true story, but in order to make the film feel as authentic to the geography and the culture as possible. However, <laughs> at their own admission, they knew very early on in the creation of this film that they didn't want to limit themselves creatively by sticking closely to the facts. Director Simon Wells shared that they did a lot of studies on Gnome at the time, but they took fairly large creative liberties with the story because the original events involved over 20 teams of dogs running the relay. Yeah. They felt like it was best to concentrate on a limited number of characters and get the emotional themes flowing. And he said, if you tried to have hundreds of characters who all played crucial roles in the story, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to achieve the right pacing and character development. I mean, which we get it. Yeah. 20 teams. It's like, Wikipedia says it's like 150 sled dogs. Yes. That'd be so mm -hmm. many characters. <laughs> yes. 150 plus sled dogs. You had to condense. Yes. You had to simplify. So instead of simplifying them, they basically just omitted them. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I, I do get it. I understand right. his Let's point. Let's do away with all these guys. I don't like any of them. Let's just bring in all new dogs. <laughs> so you know what? Okay. Yeah. Balto was the famous one. Yep. We'll call that one Balto. Mm -hmm. Great. Here we go. But he's not a sled dog. Right. Well, Wait, what? We got, we <laughs> what do get you mean there. he's not a sled dog? We gotta get there. <laughs> he's not a sled dog. I said it. I'm not going back. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> but I, I do understand this on the part of the creators. And no, it makes Especially sense. after reading about each team and each pass of the baton, so to speak. Yeah. I do think it's important for us today to recognize that there were many native Alaskan mushers and teams that are pretty much always eclipsed in the hype. Of course. Not only when it happened in 1924, 25, but also, you know, throughout the film and the film's popularity, and even today. So I think they're just as deserving mm -hmm. of recognition. Not to mention the most heroic sled dog of the whole journey, which is not Balto. It's not Balto. And you may be familiar with that or aware of that, listener, because of the recent um, mm -hmm. Disney Plus film that came out about Togo. I never wanted to see that, but now I do. Yes, uh, same. I haven't seen it yet, but now yeah, that I- I want to watch it. Now that I know so much, I definitely do want to- Check it out. I think I will before we do part two. It seemed really sad, which yeah, that's that's why we're that's here. The whole so. point, right? I need to get over that. Dying children isn't sad enough for you guys. We have so much to talk about, and Togo is just one piece, even still, of the mm -hmm. full story. Togo. I hope I'm saying his name right. I didn't look it up because Togo sounded weird. I would think Togo. Yeah. Okay. I or to go. To go. I'll take this to go. <laughs> That's what Sapala said when he went to his kennel. <laughs> ha ha. Okay. Oh. For the history, I'll be quoting and paraphrasing from the AKC, the American Kennel Club site, right. um, Wikipedia, and this lit site, Alaska article by Jennifer Hodek. Sweet. Hodek. Here we go. Cue the dramatic music. Not that Mush. Funny. Mush. Nome, Alaska lies approximately two degrees south of the Arctic Circle, and while greatly diminished from its peak of 20,000 inhabitants during the gold rush at the turn of the 20th century, it was still the largest town in northern Alaska in 1925, with 455 Alaska natives and 975 settlers of European descent. Wow. Small town. In the winter of 1924, Curtis Welch was the only doctor in Nome. He and four nurses working at the small Maynard Columbus Hospital served the town and the surrounding area. And after discovering the hospital's entire batch of diphtheria antitoxin had expired, 
Welch placed an order for more. However, the replacement shipment did not arrive before the port was closed by ice. Mm. Diphtheria antitoxin, if you've ever wondered, because I did, <laughs> was developed and came into medical use in the late 1800s. I looked this up. It's crazy. Yeah. It's not only an antibiotic, but a solution of concentrated proteins that contain antibodies obtained from the blood of horses yeah. that have been immunized against diphtheria toxin, which is the toxin that the bacteria emits because it's a bacterial infection. Guys, they Mind take blowing. the diphtheria toxin, they inject it into horses, and once their body creates the antibodies, they take the blood and whatever chemically separate the blood from the antibodies, mm -hmm. and that's how they create the serum, the antitoxin. Yeah, science is really cool. It's absolutely crazy. Except that there's also a whole story about how there was a whole batch of diphtheria antitoxin that yeah, I heard about that too. Was compromised because the horse contracted tetanus, and it was like this whole thing. Yeah, so it's, th there are some risks to that type of uh, innovative treatment. It's no but. longer recommended because there's now a vaccine. Right. So. Thank God for vaccines. But it is still available. You can still get diphtheria antitoxin from the CDC, yeah. which is crazy. That's wild it's available in some places, I should say. I guess they but can yeah. test it and make sure there's nothing else wrong with it now. But a right. hundred years ago, that wasn't as easy. Well, honestly, it was one of the because we've talked about the FDA before yeah. on the show. Yeah, it was one of the incidents that spurred the creation of the FDA. Yeah, because they needed a way to regulate. The drugs. And also, you know, more broad reaching, like this particular incident with the antitoxins in Alaska, it like changed how the rest of America viewed uh, diphtheria. Mm -hmm. And it was like this whole like medical reformation yes. throughout the rest of the states. Man, you're just getting. <laughs> oh, sorry. We were just on a roll. No, no, no. I mean, it, it's all relevant. But yeah, there is definitely a piece of this whole story that that relates to that for sure. It's just like this is a very historically um like significant story. Yes. It's not just a movie. For many reasons, not just the yeah, not just the dogs and not just the cute dogs. Dr. Welch noticed the first case of diphtheria in December 1924 and he initially dismissed it as tonsillitis mm. since he hadn't seen other symptoms of the very highly contagious disease in town. However, after the deaths of two Inupiaq children and an unusually large number of tonsillitis cases in town, quoting, mm. Welsh suspected something worse. In January, a month after the first fatality, Welsh saw signs of diphtheria in a three-year-old boy who suffered from a high fever and weakness, and he passed away within two weeks. Wow. The following day, when a seven-year-old girl presented the same telltale symptoms of diphtheria, Welch attempted to administer some of the expired antitoxin to see if it might have any effect. But the girl died a few hours later. Wow. Diphtheria as a disease, <laughs> trigger warning um, if you're not into the medical stuff, but diphtheria as a disease is really interesting because not only is it, like I was saying, the it's a bacterial infection that creates these toxins that are what eventually do kill you. Mm -hmm. But one of the symptoms, it's all the standard, you know, runny nose, fever, coughing, um, yeah. excess mucus, et cetera. Difficulty breathing. But it will create this gray membrane, yeah. like on your tonsils and in your mucous membranes, yeah. which is like one of the classic symptoms of it because that's that's the toxin that it's producing right. is a gray color. When I read that, I was so grossed out. It's really Ugh, gross. It's, so, it's so gross, but it's so, it's like, it's very interesting because it's <clears throat> so different than a lot of other like res respiratory illnesses. I've never heard of that before. Yeah. I know. And then it made it really, I was going to say really easy for doctors to diagnose, but I think especially in this case with him, he was so hopeful that it wasn't right. diphtheria at first. I think that was more why he didn't identify more it of a denial. More quickly because the signs in most cases are very, very stark and you kind of know what you're dealing with. Man, oh man. So realizing that an epidemic was imminent, Welch called Nome's mayor, George Maynard, that same evening to arrange an emergency town council meeting. Mm. And the council immediately implemented a quarantine, which we know just a little bit too much about yeah, today. Very relevant. The following day, on January 22nd, 1925, Welch sent radio telegrams to all the other major towns in Alaska, alerting them of the public health risk. He also requested assistance from the U.S. Public Health Service in Washington, D.C. By the end of January, Welch had 20 more confirmed cases and 50 more at risk. Damn. And he knew the inevitable. Without antitoxin, the disease could kill the region's entire population of about 10,000 people. Oh, my God. While the film focuses primarily on the threat to children, diphtheria is a bacterial infection of the nose and throat that anyone can develop, and it has a rather high mortality rate, which is about 5 to 10%. 
and higher than that for children. Now that's making sense to me, <laughs> knowing that the true real life numbers were much larger than the movie depicted mm -hmm. because they showed like, I don't know, three or four kids at most being sick. Yeah. But they talked about like the dogs acted like all of their this children really bad. were sick. Yeah. But the movie never showed more than like two or three. I get why they wouldn't. Well, <laughs> I sure. Do. I was just saying that's like clear in my mind now of like, wait a minute. And honestly, the fatalities, like the, the fatalities are not very well documented yeah. because a lot of them were natives, were natives and native children. And yeah. Which is unfortunate in Yupiak, yes. But the um yeah. the fatalities that were recorded were it was like five, six, seven, and then there were hundreds more that we probably just didn't have recorded. Right. Which sucks. Right. But the, the fact that it just it has that potential to spread and the mortality rate is so high. Yeah, that's scary. And and again, it's not just kids. It's it's everybody's at risk when mm. there's no immunity, which is the issue here. Right. But today, thanks to widespread vaccinations, the DTAP or Tdap vaccine for diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, this vaccine became widely used around the 1940s. And so diphtheria is now relatively rare in developed countries. Thank God. Although I got pertussis. So <laughs> after being vaccinated and boosted, like with the Tdap or whatever. You got it? Later in life. I got pertussis. What is that? <laughs> oh, whooping cough. Oh. It's a pretty rare thing. And the health department gets involved when you have it. Um, I had it when I was in college. And I think part of it was the fact that I was vaccinated and I still contracted it. And they're like, oh, this is bad. I thought the whooping cough was as you know common as like the flu. Mm -mm. Wow. Huh. No. What do I know? I learn something new every time we record. Hey, I know a little bit too much about these specific pretty neat. medical things. As neat as uh, <laughs> illness and death can be. But I mean, yeah, even today, like tetanus is still a huge deal and you're vaccinated against it. But if you have exposure or potential for exposure, yeah, you still you need the booster. Yeah. Boosted. yeah. I got a booster a few years ago. Yeah. You just never know. Rusted nail. And the fact that we have the technology and we have the medicine and we, you know, over a hundred years now or close to a hundred years, I guess that this has been widely used, but the vaccine yeah. was developed, you know, just in the decades right after this whole incident. Right. So they were on the edge of this happening. It just hadn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. Which is a big part of what we'll get to later. Necessity breeds invention. Temperatures plunging to 50 below and snow and ice measured in yards made travel impossible. Mm. Planes couldn't fly. Um, and I was always confused by that as a kid watching. I was like, okay, it's windy. The planes can't fly. But it's more than that because the technology that we had in terms of aviation at the time mm -hmm. was limited. It was all fairly new. These planes that they were trying to use were World War One planes, mm -hmm. um, which were water-cooled. And so they were unreliable in cold weather. And... In the years that followed, bush flying became a more common way to, to travel in the winters and send mail, et cetera. But even that at the time was so experimental and the planes were not considered reliable. Yeah. And besides just the planes, steamships couldn't access the area for ice. Right. The only link to the rest of the world during winter in this area was the Iditarod Trail, which ran 938 miles from the port of Seward in the south across several mountain ranges and the vast Alaskan interior, connecting the railroad station in Nanana to the town of Nome. Mm -hmm. So the train could only go so far. Correct. There was only a railroad so Up far. Up to a certain into... point. Exactly. Gotcha. Which is how this all kind of came to be. Because the new trains could go through ice, but it's super dangerous. And I'm sure that was part of the reason why the railroad what hadn't been constructed to that point. It just amazes me. It amazes me. Like I can see exploring new terrain and like literally weathering these like storms, these snowstorms and this crazy chaos, these blizzards, avalanches. I can see exploration. I can't see settling an entire town. I know. In one of the most isolated, dangerous places to live in the whole it's planet. It's really close to the Arctic Circle, like I was saying. Like, it's it's a pretty distant place. But that's something that I feel like we should do now, not like a hundred years ago. I mean, people hey, lived there. tell that to the, yeah, tell that to everybody that went for the gold rush. They lived that's, there. That's yeah. really why this town was put on the map. That makes sense. The people were rush. willing to risk it all for gold. Exactly. For wealth. That's why. And then the, the um, it had just dwindled. The population had since dwindled because um, yeah. not only had the gold well, run dry, but people were realizing that it was a pretty isolated pretty, place yeah. to live. Probably a lot of people died too. Oh yeah. Killed off a lot of the population. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's basically almost Russia. I know. It's like Sarah Palin's house. You can see Russia yeah, from the back door. Yeah. We, uh, we purchased it from Russia. That's so crazy to me. It's definitely a, a, Totally different climate than anything you or I mm -mm. are used to in any way. Wild stuff. And then the natives are just like, we were fine without you guys. We were good. Exactly. Well, that's the whole, yeah. 
that's another big part of the story is that uh, we brought the diseases to the area. Um, we being, you know, European what do you mean? settlers. What do you mean? Mark Summer, not to be confused with Mark Summers of Double Dare, oh, wow. superintendent of the Territorial Board of Health, proposed the idea of using two of the fastest dog teams to get the antitoxin to Nome. <laughs> Just two. Leonard Sapala, a famed musher with some of the best sled dogs around, Siberian huskies that were imported directly from Siberia, yeah. along with his 12-year-old lead dog, Togo, who had won the All-Alaska Sweepstakes three times and many kennel races, was suggested as one of the teams. Is this the guy that Willem Dafoe is playing in the Togo movie? It is. Okay. One and the same. Cool. Now I'm definitely going to watch it. Sapala. 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 I'm keeping that in. <laughs> Perfect, because my pronunciation sucks all the time. <laughs> and now people will know how hard I do try to get it right. Do or do not. Another musher in the relay, Norwegian, Gunnar Kaysen. 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 A, not A. A, not A. Sapala. Sapala and Kaysen. 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 Ka- Kaysen. <laughs> A, not A. A, not A. A, not A. Kaysen. Kaysen. Ka- you would think that would come naturally to me. Kaylin. Yeah. Just think Kaylin. Kaylin. Kaysen. <laughs> Another musher in the relay, Norwegian, Gunnar Kaysen, put his faith in a young freight dog from Sapala's kennel, three-year-old Balto. Three years old. Balto, the dog, as you've probably seen from photos, was actually black in color. Mm -hmm. And director Wells emphasized that while the real Balto was not particularly purebred, he was not a racing dog either. He was just on one of the working teams that hauled cargo around. Ah. And there was no evidence that there was any wolf blood in him either. Right. (laughs) Yeah, I saw that they did a bunch of genetic testing on his... Um, I have it all written down. Okay, you got it. I got it. You it's go. It's all in here. This is one of the first times I'll I actually like there. read into anything that you've just covered. I can tell. <laughs> I, I like, yeah, I'll tell you all about I it. I was fascinated. I wanted to know everything. It is fascinating, in my, in my opinion. Just doing the best I can to show up today. I appreciate that. It's been a while. So at this point, there is this concerted effort to get this antitoxin to Nome. And hospitals along the West Coast started consolidating their serum to Seattle, but that was still going to take a week or more to arrive, um, honestly longer. So 300,000 units of serum were discovered at the Alaska Railroad Hospital in Anchorage, which was over 500 miles away from Nome. Wow. Um, And although this wasn't enough to you know, really treat the population of Nome, it could slow the spread of the disease until this larger shipment arrived from Seattle with over 1 million units. Yeah. Okay. And like you said earlier, people were dying within a couple of weeks. So they really didn't have any time to spare. They didn't have any time to spare on this at all. And they needed to get the serum there as fast as they could. And honestly, it was kind of a miracle that the, I think it was like the surgeon at the Alaska Railroad Hospital that happened to find viable serum there, which that wow. I don't think was even supposed to be there or it, you know, wasn't necessarily accounted what for. A discovery. So that was lucky in and of itself that they found something that was closer than Seattle. See, miracles do happen. Well, when you believe. I think it's aliens. So this first shipment of serum was transported immediately by train to Nanana at the order of Governor Scott Bone. <laughs> yes. Scott Bone. I knew you were waiting for it. God. <laughs> It's the best name in the world. Governor Bone. Bone. I, listener, you must know, <laughs> you must be aware that Christian and I both had researched this figure of history. And Christian asked me specifically to make sure that you I included please, his name. <laughs> you please make sure you say the name Governor Bone. He, he One, asked and he said, please. First of all, it's a dog movie. So, yeah, Bone. Governor Bone. Pun, Perfect. immediate pun right off the top. Um, Mm-hmm. Sounds like a nickname for my penis. Oh my god! When I introduced you, <laughs> he introduced you to Governor Bone. Y'all have no idea how thrilling. Take was you to Governor this. Bone's house, mm-hmm. if you know what I mean. Governor Bone's office. The governor will see you now. <laughs> <laughs> Is anybody still here? I'm sorry, Governor Bone's in a meeting right now. He'll be with you momentarily. You need a uh, John Hancock from Governor Bone. <laughs> <laughs> that was a pretty good one. Okay. <clears throat> We're good at this. We do this all the time and we have a podcast. I hope more come to me. I hope more come to me (laughs) as we go. Had to go for the obvious. This episode has more bonus content in it than even episode content. Governor bonus content. Governor bonus content. (laughs) But as much as we are poking fun at him, we must say thank you to Governor Scott Bone, not a euphemism. 
because he did help to organize this relay and get all of the driver's mushers settled and situated. Although it took considerable effort, as you can imagine, they used the mail system, actually. I didn't write this in my notes, but it is pretty cool. They used the mail system to... I've lost him again. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. They used the mail system. Oh. It took a considerable effort <laughs> on the part of Governor Bone. Now you're just in a neighborhood that you're... <laughs> That you're living in at this point. To to organize this relay, wink, mm-hmm. wink. Mm-hmm. It was. It was a relay, and uh, he organized this it. This is a roads that I drive down alone sometimes, and I can't if ever you can't find tell. my map. Yep. Got, you got a lot of cul-de-sac to cover. It's a cul-de-sac. I'm handing them to you. <laughs> and part hand, of me is doing it for fun, but the hand. other part of me is like, did we lose did we lose everything? <laughs> I think, is this the I moment that it happened? This is what they came here for. I think January this is part 2024. of the fun. I think this is all what they were missing for the past two months. Listener. <laughs> Governor Bone. If you've been waiting on us to talk about Governor Bone, then you're welcome. I'd vote for him. But they, they used the the U.S. postal system yeah. to help coordinate the drivers. And at their different relay points, they were supposed to wait for messages or whatever signals and then proceed to the checkpoint to then meet the relay or the... I don't even know. I, I didn't write this down because it's really confusing and complicated. Yeah, there's a lot to it, yeah. Really, the main thing that you should know about the relay or the organization of the relay is that it was very complex and it was very difficult to do. And yeah. obviously, they didn't have communication devices, you know, on their person like we do today. So they were utilizing systems like postal system institutions across the mail route mm-hmm. to communicate with mushers and basically get everybody where they need it to be, you know, because not only do you have to, if you're going to have a relay, you have this list of drivers and where they need to be when, Mm -hmm. but also they have to arrive at their checkpoint. So they are already making a journey from wherever they live to their checkpoint to then continue. Do you know if the telegraph was as much of a uh, device? Yeah, they were using it. For Mm -hmm. this specific purpose? Mm -hmm. They were using a telegraph. Each checkpoint at like the postal routes and everything, probably each moment. There were a lot of messages by telegraph. telegraph. It It was Mm -hmm. such a huge part of the movie. It was was so big in the movie and it was so like, it It felt so important to me as a child. It was very well done. So I think that, I think that that part, at least they, they did rely on that. And then using that little dog to be the dog's telegraph (laughs) communicator to the rest of the dogs. It's awesome. It's the only dog in the movie that does not have a speaking role. Ironically, the one that's communicating Mm, with everybody. That's true. Doesn't have any lines. That's true. But yeah, it's just so interesting when you're putting it in perspective of technology of a hundred years ago and what they had access to and didn't have access to. And it also makes this story even more impactful when you consider that this was really the beginning of, you know, news that would sweep the country quickly. Right. As this was happening, there was news coverage in cities across the United States. So people in real time were learning what was going on and what was happening. Yeah. And not only that, but this was also occurring in the middle of 20 year low temperatures because of this high pressure system mm. um, that was moving through that actually in the same storm, the same system that caused these blizzards froze the Hudson River that year. Oh, my God. In New York. Wow. So this was like, it made it feel very modern to me as I was reading through it because it was like, this was happening to everyone simultaneously. We were all learning about it. I say we as if I was there. The country was learning about it all at the same time. Kind of. I kind of like, what's that? I don't know. I don't know the word for like being nostalgic for a time you never were, you weren't alive for. There's Mm -hmm. a a word floating around as a meme. There is a word. Yeah. Uh, I kind of am nostalgic for those times when like the whole country was like waiting with bated breath to find out the fate of this one thing. That still happens, which I I don't know something about it. I don't know if it's the sociologist in me. Extra. Read all about it. Something about when those collective stories are in the news, it should unify people. And I'm afraid in today's day and age, it does a lot to do the opposite. It's an interesting question to think about. Something to just sort of muse on is like all these big historically significant moments, these heroic efforts, these whether they're victories or tragedies or whatever in history, it's always around these like the coldest winter on record. Mm -hmm. I know. Like that happened with like the freaking Donner Party. Like that was like one of the coldest time periods. And we, of Mm -hmm. course, we talked at length about the Black Plague. Yep. And how like that was a a little ice age for Mm -hmm. hundreds of years. Like all these things happen during the most extreme weather time periods. Yeah, don't they? And it's like either that's what makes these stories crazy, tragic, or heroic, or whatever, or 
the extreme conditions is what makes the heroes or the right. tragic figures. Yeah. This is, it's a, which, is which, which came first. It, there's no way to know, but yeah. it is, it's crazy to think about. And it is very interesting that these weather phenomena, you know, and these diseases, you know, things that humanity yeah. still cannot control. Yeah, this theory these are outbreak. the things that we cannot, these biological processes. Do they know what caused it? What caused the. What caused this outbreak? Maybe it was just the extreme temperature lows. There is nothing really clear other than the fact that there are a lot of European settlers in areas where there is not natural immunity of any okay, kind. Yeah. And granted, there wasn't a ton of natural immunity to diphtheria anyway, because it has such a high mortality rate, which is the same situation that you get into with something like the plague. So these vows from Anchorage are transported immediately by train to Nanana, yeah. padded with quilts, and finally in this metallic cylinder, which weighed a little over 20 pounds. Wow, okay. And this is where the first musher... Wild Bill Shannon uh, <laughs> embarked at 9 p.m. on January 27th with the vials of antitoxin. Can he be trusted? We'll find out. <laughs> Pretty wild. Despite a temperature of negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit, Shannon left immediately with his team of nine inexperienced dogs led by Blackie. The temperature continued to drop and the team was forced onto the colder ice of the river because the trail had been destroyed by horses. Wow. And despite jogging alongside the sled to keep warm, Shannon developed hypothermia. He reached his relay point, Minto, at 3 a.m. with parts of his face black from frostbite. Oh, my God. That sounds so painful. I cannot imagine what any of these mushers went through. I really can't. I can't. I don't have the stamina physically or mentally, to be honest. That just results in parts of your face falling off. You just lose chunks of skin and, yeah, it's bad. To save this village. So this is 3 a.m. He's been going at this for, what, six hours now? Mm. After warming the serum by the fire and resting for four hours, Shannon dropped three of his dogs who would pass away, Oof. unfortunately, and he left with his remaining team. Wow. And so the relay continued. And the trip that they're making usually took about a month. A month? Um, which is why the relay part was so necessary, because they needed to take it in shifts to be able to complete it more quickly. Jeez, because the whole thing only lasted like five days. Correct. Five days. Oh, my God. The serum was passed from one musher to another for legs of roughly 24 miles up to 52 miles. And more than 20 mushers took part in this great race of mercy, as it came to be known, facing this blizzard and these record, you know, temperatures. And I got temperatures all over the place. I can't be sure what was accurate because different sources had different temperatures. But mm -hmm. I do know that it was the coldest that it had been in decades. <laughs> Friggin' uh, icy hell on earth is what yes, we're talking about. I cannot imagine no like, i hate being that cold me too i oh i can't imagine i'm chilly right now have socks on and i'm like you know i don't have my heater on because we're recording and i'm like it's a little bit cold it's literally probably at least 68 degrees in the house <laughs> fahrenheit try 100 degrees less than that exactly i just can't even imagine yeah I wish that I had time, like I said, to recount each one of the musher's stories here. Some are incomplete. Some we know more about than others, their leg of the journey. Mm -hmm. But the mushers, most of them native Alaskans, were very motivated by the urgency of saving lives and preventing this disease from spreading to surrounding villages. Hearts of gold. These same mushers had very recently witnessed the devastation of the 1918 and 19 Spanish influenza, oh, wow. which was a pandemic mm -hmm. that had ravaged every native village. And that one caused fatalities in about 50% of the native population of Nome and 8% of the native population of Alaska as a whole. So they just watched this yeah. with the flu and were on the verge of having it happen again with something that I think is really even more, has an even higher mortality rate. Damn. Obviously, we're trying to articulate it, but I really don't think we can overstate how perilous the conditions were. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I think the film did also do a good job of portraying because, you know, you're snow blind. You can't see anything. There's no visibility. Dude. The wind is insane. Snow blindness is no joke. That's, it's not conditions that human beings are designed to exist in. We're dogs. And one of the saddest parts of the story to me is that several of the 150 plus dogs that were on these sled teams were killed by the elements. Mm. And, you know, many, yeah. not just uh, Wild Bill Shannon, but many of the mushers suffered frostbite. These are all true heroes, humans and dogs alike. By January 30th, the number of cases of diphtheria in Nome had reached 27. And a reporter living there stated, all hope is in the dogs and their heroic drivers. Nome appears to be a deserted city. Oh, my God. So they're in this quarantine, but the cases are still climbing because there isn't a whole lot of widespread knowledge about how the disease spreads. And also, there is no real immunity. Yeah. So this brings us back to Leonard Sapala 
the famed, you know, mm. husky breeder and musher. Willem Dafoe. Willem Dafoe in the Togo movie. In Togo. The recent movie. Taking the serum to go. So Sapala and his tired dogs traveled 84 miles in addition to the 170 that they had undertaken before they obtained the serum due to changes in plans and miscommunications. Wolf. Because drivers were added um, to the relay at different times and when he thought he would have to do a certain portion himself and he was trying to reach certain relay points and at one point I don't remember all of the details that I read it is rather confusing since I don't know the geography really well and I'm going by just town names and stuff but right. at one point they had to catch Sapala on the trail and transfer the serum because he had different marching orders than oh. some of the other mushers as they were trying to streamline and make the relay more efficient while it was happening. That's gotta be so hard because there's really no way to communicate if you're on on the go. And if you miss towns, which happened in several cases, you just totally mm -hmm. blow by a town. You don't even know it's there because you're blind. Yeah, um, you can't see anything. Yeah. Then you also miss that information. So oh my God. It wasn't easy. Oh my God. So Paula took a short rest and left again at 2 a.m. on February 1st, heading into another fierce storm. After following the shoreline and ascending the 5,000 feet of Little McKinley Mountain and other escapades that involve crossing the sound, which was apparently mm. colder. It's more like a wind tunnel, I guess. It was like a very, very dangerous part of the trail, and he was considered the only one that was qualified to do it, I think. Wow. So he goes through all of this on his own and arrives to transfer the serum to Charlie Olson in Bluff. Gotcha. And after Charlie Olson's leg, it was then handed off to what would become the last team of the relay, mm -hmm. led by Gunnar Kaysen, yeah. with Balto, and a dog named Fox as well. Fox. <laughs> and if you're wondering, Fox who? We have to talk about Fox very soon. All right. The storm grew steadily worse, and Kaysen relied heavily on Balto to make out the trail. But despite his inexperience, Balto lived up to the challenge, and in whiteout conditions with limited visibility, Balto kept them on track. They did, however, pass the next stop, Solomon, without realizing it. Hmm. And the winds were so powerful at one point that the sled was blown over into the air and the serum was knocked out. Oh, wow. Okay. Kaysen had to dig in the snow with his bare hands Lord. to recover the vials and suffered frostbite to his fingers in doing so. So some of that is based off of reality. There's some, there's some similarities in there for sure in the film. The last 55 miles is a whole movie. Somehow, with some kind of insane stamina, they all forged ahead and Kaysen arrived in port safety where the final leg of the relay was supposed to begin. Hmm. But the last team and its driver, Ed Roan, believed that Kaysen and the relay were halted in Solomon due to the inclement weather, the stop that he totally missed. Yeah. So they were asleep when Kaysen and Balto made it to the final relay point. Wow. This is where Kaysen decided to continue on in order to save the time that it would take to wake them, change sleds, and hitch up a new team. So he traveled the remaining 25 miles to Nome and arrived at Front Street at 5.30 a.m. with all ampules of the antitoxin intact. So they weren't supposed to be the last Correct. leg. Kaysen was not the last musher on the relay. Wow. I read several quotes and accounts that described their arrival into Nome where after he delivered the antitoxin, Kaysen collapsed and then he got up and began to pull ice splinters out of his dog's paws. Oh. And it all just breaks my heart into pieces. What a guy. But they did it. And like you said, it had taken them only five days, 127.5 hours, to deliver the cargo. Mm. The AKC site said, Everyone knew that many hearts, hands, and paws had contributed to this life-saving effort. Everyone also knew that Togo had actually taken the longest and most perilous route. Right. But Balto the sled dog, who led the final sprint, became the symbol of it all, of teamwork, courage, tenacity, and hope when there seems to be no reason for it. Man. Of course, I can't tell you this story without talking about the controversy around it, because Balto and Kaysen's fame is debated and criticized all over the place. Yeah. Some sources claim, and... This feels really close to the film, so I do wonder how much inspiration they took from these accounts at the time in the 90s, that there was considerable controversy surrounding Balto's use as a lead dog on Kaysen's team, including many mushers and others at the time who doubted whether he could have truly led the team at all, based primarily on the dog's track record. So they're doubting it happened? They're doubting that Balto was the lead oh. because no records exist of Sapala ever having used Balto as a leader in runs or races prior to 1925. And Sapala himself is quoted as saying that Balto was never in a winning team and was a scrub dog. Sapala said in statements made after the run, you know, after the fact, he said he never wished to take credit from any man or dog involved in the run, but he did resent the Balto statue for if any dog deserves special mention, it was Togo. Oh, right. Yeah. 
<laughs> my leg of the race was way better I than know. his. It's so I don't like, think it's really it's fair. It's all really complicated <laughs> because it feels petty to me because you were trying to save lives. You were trying to save lives. He feels Is this like where steel comes into play. Right. The pride of steel. I, maybe there's some character. pride in here, but we have to consider also. To remind you, if I if I didn't say it or if I did say it at this point, I can't even remember. Who knows? You've got Sapala and his prize winning, like fastest dog in the land, 12 yeah. years old, by the way. He's a 12 year old dog at this point. Togo is. It's very old. So Togo is a 12 year old dog that has taken the longest and most perilous route hun- over 100 miles, like closer yeah. to 200 miles in his round. Very trip. close. Yeah. Yeah. But then you have Balto, who has never been a sled dog, isn't really, um, he wasn't bred for it, you know? Right. And he was chosen by a musher, I, I believe, with also less experience. Yeah. Also only being three years old at the time. But he was chosen from Sapala's kennel. So Sapala owned both dogs. So that's important to note as well. I agree that one dog shouldn't be the hero. I don't think Balto should be the hero. In the accounts that I could tell, it felt like, and I'm just projecting emotion into it at this point because we don't know them and we weren't there 100 years ago, but it felt like Sapala was angry because Togo had been slighted because he felt Togo was the best sled dog to ever exist. Sure. And, yeah. you know, this loyal dog to him for 12 years and then a puppy essentially comes along and kind of, you know. Wins the hearts wins of the, the world. Wins the hearts of the world, America, America et cetera. So. It's kind I of think, funny. They should have just named Steel Togo. I know. <laughs> that they should have just, why not? Ooh, because. These people because, are all dead. Who cares? Well, a lot of people care. A lot of people care. Very know. much so. Of course, we have to also remember that these are human egos that we're talking about. And the dogs right. are all just very good dogs who did a very good job. They're all just good boys. And the name of Togo, I don't think would, you know, I think that would make people even more angry if, if Togo had been slandered because Togo wasn't the prideful one. Togo was just a dog. Really? 70 years later in the 90s, people would have cared? Oh, yeah. People care today. Uh, people care right I'm now. surprised. Lots of them. Lots of native people. Lots of mushers and people in the culture of sled dogs, dog breeding, dog racing, etc. A lot of people still have a lot of opinions about okay, well. this whole scenario. Because pictures and videos of Kaysen and Balto taken in Nome were recreated hours after their arrival once the sun had risen, hmm. speculation does still exist as to whether Balto's position as lead dog was genuine or it was staged or exaggerated for media purposes due to Balto being a more newsworthy name than Fox. Oh, Fox. So if any dog should be upset because Togo did get recognition as did Balto, I think if any dog has the right to be upset, it would be Fox from what I know. But again, we don't know officially who the lead was. So you think think Fox was the lead? I think, and a lot of historians think, that although it's possible that Balto led Kaysen's team, he most likely ran co-lead with Fox rather than running single lead by himself. Okay. There's also the element that many decorated mushers and others in the surrounding area also believed, including Ed Roan, the last musher on the route, based on conversations that Kaysen and Roan had had before they left Nome, that Kaysen's decision not to wake Roan at port safety was motivated by a desire to grab the glory for himself. That would be unfortunate if true, but I also believe the theory that it would have been really difficult for him to stop and wait to wake and hitch a new team in those last moments of the relay when every minute counted and children yeah. were dying. Do you know how long it would have taken? Any accounts say? No, but I mean, in most of these cases, they only rest for, like, the, the dogs are usually ready and waiting. That's the issue is that they, like, Ed Roan was asleep. They weren't ready. They weren't ready and waiting because they thought... Yeah. Kaysen had stopped. I could see that taking a little while. So I could see that taking a while. I could see that being, you know, I'm sure that it would be efficient, but like, I get it when he's like, I'm right here and it's 25 more miles. And I would just go too. I like, I get it. I wouldn't stop. I can't, I just keep going. And I don't care about the glory of anything really ever, frankly, for myself. So it is worth noting that in the days after the initial serum run, you know how I talked about there were a lot more vials that were on their way to Nome. It's just they were going to take longer. Yeah. Um, and these vials from other locations, including Seattle, were shipped in. And a second relay was conducted in which Ed Roan delivered the supply after an 80-mile trek. Oh. So Ed Roan brought more serum to Nome. It's not like he didn't help. So he got his, his day in the sun. Yeah, but more so just... After. It wasn't like he was overlooked as far as his contribution because he did yeah. help get the antitoxin to Nome, just not the serum run in that specific instance. I'm glad it wasn't like a crazy 80s or 90s movie where they have the whole journey and they get there just in time as the main shipment actually (laughs) arrives. 
<laughs> and that so it was like cool. all for nothing. Like Home Alone. Yeah. When she like takes the van home to get back to Kevin. Mm. And then the whole family arrives like five minutes later because they took the plane she didn't want to wait for. Yeah. So she has this whole journey. That would be awful. These people's faces are falling off. Imagine. It was several days. It took it took weeks to get all of the vials that were coming to Nome yeah. safely there. Well, thank God it took weeks. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm obviously joking. Uh, but this was enough to, you know, mitigate what was right. going on at the time. Such a heroic effort. So once this all took place in October of 1926, Sapala took Togo and his team on a tour from Seattle to California and then across the Midwest to New England and consistently mm. drew huge crowds. They were featured at Madison Square Garden in New York City for 10 days, oh. and Togo received a gold medal from the city. Wow. In New England, Sapala's team of Siberians ran many races, defeating the local, you know, dogs that had been bred there. Yeah. And Sapala entered into a partnership with Elizabeth M. Ricker in Poland Spring, Maine, where many of his dogs then went to live in retirement and contribute to their breeding program, where they were breeding Siberian sled dogs. Togo was also bred here and sired many litters after that. Wow. Sapala visited Togo and was by his side when he was euthanized on December 5th, 1929, at the age of 16. Old boy. And after his death, Sapala had Togo preserved and mounted, and today the dog is on display in a glass case at the Adidarod Museum in Wasala, Alaska. My God. Togo's prowess as a sled dog also led to his strengths being preserved through breeding, like I was talking about, mm -hmm. with his descendants contributing to the Sapala Siberian sled dog, which is a breed of dog, essentially, a Siberian husky breed, but it's like the most sought after working sled dog line. And it's also the modern mainstream show stock of the Siberian Husky gene pool. Wow. So most Siberian Huskies that are registered, like AKC registered today, share DNA with Togo. That's incredible. Or the breeding group. I don't usually agree with dog breeding. I know. I think it's a kind of uh, shitty industry. Well, in modern times, but... it's it's really controversial like it's yeah. not the same as it was when dogs were working dogs were bred for work for purposes yes yeah now it's for like shows and stuff the working dog breeds are different but now yeah. it's but a that's actually pretty cool complicated and i mean there are interesting things when you get it I, I there's just i could go on a million rabbit trails about dog breeding and dog shows yeah. because that was a hyper fixation of third grade kaylin but <laughs> oh i can imagine as we've been saying, Togo also received well-deserved film recognition himself, not just Balto, mm -hmm. on Disney Plus in 2019. And the dog actor uh, that portrayed Togo in the movie, oh. his name is Diesel, and yeah. he is a direct descendant yes. of Togo's from 14 generations back. Wow, that's incredible. I love it. Good thing. You know what? Keep the royalties within the family. That's what I say. <laughs> right. So many bones for Togo's descendant. Mm -hmm. Togo, well, Togo deserved it. Togo is a great dog and he deserved it. Every bit Such of recognition boy. that he got too. Yeah. Unfortunately, none of the other mushers received the same degree of attention as Togo and Balto, though Wild Bill Shannon did briefly tour with Blackie, who was his lead dog. Okay. Yeah. The media largely ignored the Alaska native mushers who covered two thirds of the distance to Nome. I'm not surprised at all. According to musher Edgar Calland, it was just an everyday occurrence as far as we were concerned. Oh, wow. They were just putting their heads down and doing the work mm -hmm. like so many people do, especially indigenous people. They believe in the, the greater good. getting the shaft. Yeah. Yeah. So that is wow. so unfortunate. Yeah, it is. As far as Balto's fate after the serum run, though he was able to tour a little bit, um, he appeared in a silent film, The May After the Serum Run, which made Balto himself one of the very first ever canine actors. Yeah, I did read about this. Yeah. But he was eventually abandoned to sideshows in the L.A. area. That's so sad. Which I think kind of speaks to the bitterness that Zapala did have for Balto, even though Balto, again, although we don't know whether he was the lead dog, mm -hmm. was a huge part of the completion of this run. Yeah, he was there. It's not like Balto didn't run. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like He still did it. Balto still did it, still contributed. They still couldn't have done it without dogs like Balto and Togo and Blackie right. and all of the 150 Fox. plus others. Fox. Yeah, I believe 157 dogs deserve equal recognition. Right. For sure. For sure. I was glad to read, though. That Balto was rescued through a series of fortunate events involving a <laughs> Cleveland businessman and a local newspaper. 
Okay. On March 19th, 1927, Balto and six companions were brought to Cleveland and given a hero's welcome in a triumphant parade. Aw, puppy parade. The dogs were then taken to the Brookside Zoo, which is now the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo, where they lived out their days and were cared for by a loving veterinarian in their passing. That sounds so sweet. Today, Balto lives on, and not only in the real-life Central Park statue we see in the opening credits, uh, which he was present for the unveiling of, by the way. I think that's adorable. I like to think he barked at it in recognition. Yes. (laughs) Why did I say yes like that? (laughs) Yes. Yes, he did. What? I have no idea. (laughs) And there's also a second statue in Anchorage near the Iditarod Museum. Yeah, I read that. That's why I was confused. I'm like, why wasn't there just a Balto statue in Anchorage and a Togo statue in New York since he visited New York? I'll get there too. All right. After Balto's death in 1933 at 14 years old, he was also taxidermied and has taken up his afterlife residence at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, unlike Togo, he had been neutered prior to his life as a sled dog. So the puppies that are seen in later Balto sequels are definitely (laughs) fictional. But the only fictional thing about those movies (laughs) is puppies. (laughs) Despite this, his DNA is still making an impact. In an article published by Spectrum News One during the summer of last year, I learned that the Zoonomia Project, which is an international collaboration to discover the genomic basics of shared and specialized traits in mammals, recently extracted his DNA to search for specific sequences tied to the traits that helped him survive the extreme conditions. Okay. Through the project, researchers found that Balto was more genetically diverse than modern breeds, making him what's known as an Alaskan Husky, with several different breeds of dogs that we know today kind of intermingled. Right. But it also made him better equipped to thrive under those intense conditions. I must note that the museum is currently undergoing refurbishment. So if you're hoping to see Balto for yourself, you may have to wait until the end of 2024. You know what I just thought? Why don't they clone him? Clone Balto? They've cloned other animals before. Yeah, I guess they could try. They did it for Dolly. Yeah, clone Balto and freaking populate the earth with that shit. I'm sure that there are a lot of like projects that study the viability of stuff like that in genetics right now because these dogs back then they were a lot less inbred and a lot more healthy than like modern Mm -hmm. dog breeds and even even huskies right from all the inbreeding they become less and less healthy so man i see huskies all over the place here in southern alabama and it's just so mad (laughs) bad for them i wanted this movie is why i guarantee but i wanted a husky so Badly. I did too so until, I, until I learned how bad the climate is for them. The dog just means a lot to me, but they are so difficult to care for, especially in a climate like this. So, yes. Sapala himself spent many more years working with sled dogs, racing and breeding champions, and he died at the age of 90 in 1967 and was buried in Nome. Right in the snow. With the invention of the snow machine in the 1960s, the use of sled dogs as a sole means of transportation became pretty much obsolete. Mm -hmm. Um, And in the last half of the 20th century, dog mushing regained popularity, especially as a recreational sport. Sure. A reenactment of the serum run was held in 1975 to mark the 50th anniversary of the Great Race of Mercy, and participants included descendants of many of the original mushers. Wow. A decade later, President Ronald Reagan sent a letter of recognition to each surviving musher of the 1925 serum run, at the time being Charlie Evans, Edgar Noller, and Bill McCarty. And on January 18th, 1999, the last survivor, Noller, died of a heart attack. Oh my God. So the last surviving musher... Jeez. was alive to see Balto as a film, wow. although I don't know that he ever did. That's mind-blowing to me. Beginning in 1997, an annual run from Nanana to Nome was instituted, an estimated 776 miles. And while this modern serum run recognizes the achievements of the serum run mushers, the race includes participants on snow machines as well as dog sleds, ah. and it includes stops at villages along the way to promote childhood inoculations. That's pretty cool, though. So it's all done as a campaign to support getting all of the right vaccines and life-saving, you know, utilizing these life-saving scientific advancements. And and it kind of is a marketing campaign for that. And as we kind of get to the end of the reality part of this story, I really hope that it's clear that my intention here is not to take away from the legacies of Balto or Togo or Kaysen or Sapala or any of the native mushers, dogs, or care teams that made this run possible. Of course. Clearly, especially when the story receives so much hype, even at the time, researching and seeking quotes and stories almost 100 years later, 
there's no way to be certain of the true personalities or intent of any of those mentioned. Mm. Despite not being able to determine the true rankings, order, or motives in every single instance, we know for a fact that this was a life-saving run and everyone involved were heroes for making the effort that they did. Every single one. And now, to bridge the gap from reality to fiction, I'll read another quote from director Simon Wells, who stated, I can understand the concern about how far the plot of the movie deviates from the historical truth. And I feel badly for the many families who are proud of their relatives' involvement in the real-life heroics. Hmm. The movie is a fantasy based loosely on historical events and concentrates on one character's personal journey. And that character is highly fictionalized, too. We never set out to make a documentary, and in our defense, the live-action frame of the film does indicate that what we are being told is a childhood memory, and it's being told to entertain a grandchild, so it may have considerable deviations from fact in it. That's true. I know that when the Balto statue was commissioned for Central Park, many people felt it should have been Togo, Mm. but Balto had been the hero of the sensationalist news stories, and that's the name everyone had heard. And this is a point that I think it's very important to bring up, as did Simon Wells. In a compromise, the plaque on the statue does not name Balto specifically, Hmm. but talks about all of the sled dogs, which is why we made the decision to read it out in full in the final scene of the film, Wells said. Oh, okay. That was very important to him that they do recognize that the statues aren't even technically recognizing Balto. Although they look like Balto. It was just in his image. It's in his image as a tribute to all of the dogs. But it's not like Balto, the hero of the serum run in Correct. The plaque does not even have his name. Wow. Got it. Got it. I don't think on either of the statues, Central Park or Anchorage. Wow. Which is another reason why it kind of bothers me that so many people got so up in arms about it shouldn't be Balto or it should be Balto. Mm-hmm. Why can't we just spend that energy on recognizing the dogs and mushers who did what they did? It's just an Alaskan husky. Right. These these breeds of dogs, this craft, this, you know, time storied, time honored right. tradition of dog sledding. <laughs> Why can't we just honor that, you know? That's what I'm here for, yeah. And that's, yeah, that's what I'm here for as well. That's why I want the video game of just, you know, anonymous dogs saving the musher's life. And I think- I want to play as these dogs <laughs> getting through obstacles. I didn't go as much into the research of it because I knew I didn't have a ton of time, but they have the Iditarod race today. That's an annual race. Um, it's not commemorating the serum run exactly, but it is- you know, heavily inspired and influenced by mm-hmm. that run because it yeah. that run showcased what these teams were capable of and how necessary they were for the the early 20th century yeah. inhabitants. It wasn't just travel and it wasn't just for recreational entertainment. Right. It, for At that time, it was all they had. Wow. It's really, really cool. I think so. That's why there are so, I feel like there are so many dog sled movies now. I know. There have been so many in the past like couple decades, I feel like, two or three. Yeah. But I always think of the OG, Balto. Balto. Thank God we're talking about that one. So, heavy, right? (laughs) Heavy. Perfect for a kid's movie, right? (laughs) Don't you think? Oh, totally. After hearing that harrowing, perilous tale, yes, perfect for a children's (laughs) movie. People's faces were melting off. People's faces were melting, frostbite, dogs dying, blizzards Snow blindness, um, (laughs) death and diphtheria, bacteria. (laughs) Horse blood. Let's make it a kid's movie. Copious amounts of horse blood. (laughs) Oh my God, yes. Let's make a kid's movie. So if you would like to hear the story of how that happened, I would love to tell you. I'm flabbergasted. Our 90s Hollywood version of Balto's story actually came about first by way of screenwriter Elena Lesser. All right. Elena worked as a writer and story editor on animated shows and films throughout the 70s and 80s, including the Scooby and Scrappy-Doo Puppy Hour, the animated Punky Brewster, and 12 episodes of Alvin and the Chipmunks. After lending her talents to Balto, she went on to write the screenplay for Cats Don't Dance, which we will be talking about eventually. I feel like we say that every other episode because it comes up all the time. We should do it this year so we can just stop (laughs) saying that. She also wrote for several Barbie movies, including Barbie of Swan Lake and The Princess and the Pauper. Wow. And she also created the early 2000s animated series, Dragon Tales. I love Dragon Tales so Dragon much. Dragon Tales, Dragon Tales. Oh my Tales. God. I liked it as well. You know, the last time I saw Dragon Tales was when I was working in the senior residence as a physical therapy aide. Did they like Dragon Tales too? There was one room I went into on a Saturday morning. We had a very slow morning. 
she had, was watching Dragon Tales on the TV. I love that. And I sat there with her for a few minutes watching Dragon Tales. Well, I, wow. What a what a moment in your life. I don't know the last time I watched Dragon Tales, but I do know that my little sister loved it, so it was on the TV all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I've probably seen more of it than I haven't, honestly. Probably. So I was excited to see that she created it, the same mind from which Balto came. That's really cool. Elena also wrote on later episodes of Arthur and just recently wrote on a series called Molly of Denali, okay. which also had an episode on Balto, and this time they depicted him in his proper color pattern of black. Taking the glory from Blackie. <laughs> Always stealing other Always dogs' stealing glory. Thunder. Elena first recalled being told the story of Balto by her grandfather. Hmm. And personally, I love that detail because it really seemed to tee up the live action parts of the film, which does, yep. as Simon Wells said, frame Balto as this, you know, story being passed down, this infinite oral tradition on and on to generations, that sort of thing, Sure, which it kind of is in actuality. Yeah. Elena and writer Cliff Ruby, who seems to have been her partner for many, if not most, of her projects, pitched the story to Universal and Amblin, and it was relayed through executive Doug Wood, creator of Little Einsteins, who is often tied back to works we talk about, The Iron Giant, Cats Don't Dance, We're Back, to name a few, to Amblimation. Yeah, wow. And I have it on good firsthand authority that Doug is a champion of the best kinds of stories and storytellers, that authority being David Stephen Cohen. Our man. Within Amblimation, directors Phil Nibelink and Simon Wells got involved. And luckily, Simon Wells did interviews with both AnimationSource.org and Sci-Fi, which I have been and will continue pulling quotes and info from throughout. Hell yeah. And I also found a really dope article from a 1996 Cinefantastique magazine. Um, so I'll be mixing and matching between those sources. Okay, cool. Wikipedia told me that although Steven Spielberg had agreed that the story had potential, he was initially concerned that such a film would not be colorful enough. Mm -hmm. To reassure Spielberg, Wells showed him several color studies done by production designer Hans Batcher, which showed that the film would not simply depict black and white dogs <laughs> against a desolate scenery. So that, yeah, the whole Northern Lights <laughs> thing. You, you're speaking my language now. English? Hans Botcher worked in visual development for such classics as Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, We're Back, The Lion King, Hercules, Dinosaur, Fantasia 2000, Damn. Atlantis, and Brother Bear. So Shoot. you could say they were in good hands. Hans. Wow. Sorry. <laughs> Had to do it. Don't be sorry. I can 100% understand this fear of Spielberg's coming into the story. Yeah. Um, and if you haven't seen the film, listener, you might think the same hearing the story I just told you. But... As we'll discuss, the colors of this film stuck with me more than almost anything else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As Christian just said, those lovely, lovely, beautiful, perfect, amazing northern <laughs> lights. It was a nice touch. I, I liked it a lot. Thank you, Hans Botcher. Yeah, there was more color to this than I feel like even like all dogs. Yes. In a weird way. Agreed. Those colors were so muted. There's more color to this than a lot of films that I watch as a this child. This one was super vibrant. But I don't know if it's because they felt like they needed to compensate for the scenery and make it feel very colorful in that way. I'm sure. Yeah. But the colors were a huge part of the way I think of the movie and are it's pretty impressive. A huge part of how I see it in my mind. Pretty impressive. Balto was officially put into production on in March of 1993 under the working title. And I hesitate to even say this mm. when we're on the trains we're on today. Snowballs. <laughs> yes. I'm really glad they changed that. <laughs> Snowballs. What the hell? <laughs> Snowballs featuring Governor Bone. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Nibblink and Wells had initially developed Balto together before Nibblink left to continue working on We're Back. Mm -hmm. And at this point, screenwriters. Screenwriters. At this point, screenwriters Roger S.H. Shulman and David Stephen Cohen were brought on for further development. And listener. You are in for a treat yeah. because we're going to get a chance to hear their perspective firsthand in an upcoming hangout. That's confirmed. He said for yes, sure we're doing that. They said yes. Awesome. They said yes as of like yesterday, the day before. Roger did. So. Okay, great. Yeah. That's so exciting. And I'm sure we'll have plenty of both story and production questions for them. So I'm going to try not to go too much more into the script, but I am, um, as usual, very relieved that they will have a chance to correct anything that I f up in my analyses today. Please fix it, David. <laughs> Much of the animation conversation around Balto is astounding to me, but y'all know me, I can't draw to save my life. So imagining <laughs> the lengths that these creators had to go to to produce all of these classics is wild to me. I think we're going to need a sample of your drawing, though. I think oh. we're going to need to <laughs> you put that on our Patreon. Okay. 
Kaylin draws Balto. Kaylin draws Balto, a stick figure Balto. Mm-hmm. And a stick figure Jenna with the northern lights up in the Just sky. Just do the best you can. Okay. I'm warning you. My best is a... My best is a mess. I'm just picturing it now. Anyway. That's the first step of drawing anything. It's just visualizing it. Uh, see, that's the thing. I'm, good work. I'm too much of a I'm too much of a perfectionist to ever get good at drawing because I don't have the patience with myself to be bad at it first. Those are my flaws too. I work too hard. I care too much. <laughs> perfectionist. Exactly. I love too deeply. Yep. That's me. The team working on Balto consisted of over 250 animators and principal animation carried on throughout 1993 and 1994. Mush. Producer Stephen Hickner said many of the same animators worked on both We're Back and Balto. Oh, wow, but okay. with the gap that they had in between the releases, they put all of their animators through a training program of their own design to get them used to animating quadrupeds. I'm sure the character physics of these dogs is wild because I mean, each dog it's moved so good. in its own way. The movement of these dogs is so beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful things about the film. It reflected each personality, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At least with a few of them. I think so. Yeah. In Cinefantastique, he talked about how they arranged for their production studio, which was based in London, to meet with a group of Siberian husky breeders in Northampton. Mm. Simon Wells said, We got them to bring their dogs down to London for life drawing classes, and we also traveled up to watch their dogs running. And apparently they had some sort of like tricycle machine that simulated a sled. Okay. So they had these dogs, they watched them run, they watched them, how they behaved, That's moved, cool. and everything. So cool. Um, and Wells and some other crew also took an actual dog sled trip to Finland. Wow. Uh, Wells said the general environment was going to be similar to Alaska, and what they really wanted to do was study the dogs. He said, you can get an awful lot of the sense of what the long shots will look like from photographs and so on, mm -hmm. but actually being involved in what it's like being on a dog sled team, we wanted to experience. That's awesome. God, that's cool. He mentioned several times in that interview how cold the trip was and how it wasn't the easiest thing to pull off. But again, the movement of the dogs is one of the most breathtaking parts of this film to me. Mm -hmm. So at least to this Alabama girl's eye, I think it was well worth it. It's like the um, flora in Fern Gully. Mm -hmm. The animators went to. They did. They needed to see it move in life. That's awesome. And I think as an animator and as an artist, that's an experience that you really can't quantify in terms of how important it is for the mm -hmm. overall look and feel of the film. Really incredible. He also talked about how he felt like people always told him, it's really cruel. You've got these dogs running through the snow, pulling heavy sleds. And he said from his impressions in Finland, it was quite the opposite. He felt like the dogs were desperate to do it. Mm -hmm. And he said he didn't think he was just projecting it, but the sort of disappointment on the faces of the dogs that didn't get taken out each time and allowed to run was palpable. And I felt like they took the spirit of this straight to the animation. Yeah. Wow. And when you consider the fact that these dogs are bred for these purposes, it makes total sense. They mm -hmm. want to do the thing that they're meant to do. They are created, in essence, with these skill sets. Yeah. And these, you know, they've honed these skills and they want to be able to use them. And they're, they're told, they're praised for doing that exact thing. Right. So they can get a sense of it being a good thing that they're doing. Right. You know? They're rewarded for it. Right. But even if he is projecting a little bit, I mean, that's what you have to do to personify these animals. Mm -hmm. This anthropomorphism, you have to do that. <laughs> right. You have to see it into to, the, the soul yeah. of the emotion of the animal. I, I mean, I do that literally with everything I all do the too. time. So I know you do. I've heard you talk to the door, <laughs> the faucet <laughs> on more than oh, one occasion. Man. I like to keep my house happy. <laughs> if you take care of your house, it takes care of you. Here, here. Wells also revealed that their tight budget caused many difficult decisions. He said it was calculated that in most shots, the effects animators couldn't afford to include both footprints and shadows, so they had to figure out what they could get away with omitting. Yeah. And that blew my mind a little bit, remembering how impactful the overall look of the film is, because I didn't notice a hint of these missing. Mm -hmm. um, and many critics didn't either, which leads me to believe that although they faced some tough choices, they made the right ones. I was very impressed by how they maneuvered light and shadow yeah. with these dogs, like mm -hmm. when she was carrying the lantern out, yes. specifically out to like the... The light, the glowing light of the interiors and the yeah. darkness of the exterior and the way that that interior light moved and like felt... Yeah. I it is such a deep core memory from my childhood. Very well done, yeah. He said it was also challenging to achieve the snow colors and textures that were depicted in Hans Botcher's production design. 
The background artists needed to use oil paint instead of the more traditional gouache. Because oil paint dries more slowly, extra days had to be scheduled in to allow each background to dry before they could shoot the scenes on it. Jeez. Hickner said this became an advantage on occasion when they needed to make adjustments because they were able to work back into their art days later since the paint was still wet. Hmm. Wells continued on to say that he got a letter from Spielberg at the end of everything, where he said, every frame of this movie is an oil painting. It's fantastic. (laughs) The backgrounds, when painted in oil paints, actually had more voluminous quality, Wells said, and the snow looked better painted in oil paints than it did in watercolor. Yeah. And he... He felt very validated by the fact that Spielberg saw that too in the end result. You know, we talk about how like animated rain, when it's done well, it looks really good. Like animated water, like in Pinocchio Mm -hmm. specifically. Yep. Um, The snow, the blizzards. Has the same sort of quality. In this movie was so impressive to me. I'm glad that you brought up the blizzards. Um, Although the film does feature primarily, you know, hand-drawn animation, they also did incorporate some elements of CGI, such as the aurora. Aurora Borealis sequence. You have to. And the infamous snowfall and the blizzard. Mm -hmm. This was animated using a very early particle animation system, which gave it a lot of depth. Yeah. But it was apparently an absolute beast to work out how to do that and make the particles (laughs) move in the right way. I'm sure. (laughs) As I was reading about it, this part seemed an awful lot like math to me. Yeah. As I was like reading the animated descriptions of it. And that just made it so much more impressive. Yeah. I was like, this is engineering you know this is Mm -hmm. like mathematics and how we want this object to move and the velocity at which it moves and all that stuff sure so hats off to every single person and animator that was involved in the process because it looks so good and i think it it was so worth all of your time and effort i would agree as for the score which we always have to talk about this was the seventh and final score that composer James Horner wrote for an animated film. The last one. And as always, when it comes to James Horner, I absolutely love it. The soundtrack was released on December 5th, 1995 by MCA and includes the film's only song, Reach for the Light, which was performed by Steve Winwood, who was the guy that sang Higher Love. Ah. If you didn't know. Gotcha. And that's also not the only Jonas Brothers connection that we are going to find throughout our Balto journey. What's the connection? We'll get there. Okay. Next time. Or maybe the time after that. I don't know enough about the Jonas Brothers. To- of the score, Simon Wells said, James was a stunningly talented and prolific composer. He created an outstanding score for Balto, for which I will always be hugely grateful. Hmm. And I can't claim to have had a close re- working relationship with him. He was working in California and we were based in London. And also James preferred to present his score as the orchestral finished product and make alterations based on notes from that finished product as opposed to other composers that I worked with including Hans Zimmer, Hmm. who involved me in the composing process and played elements mocked up in synthesizers before the final scoring days. Sure. So it's a a different way of going about it. It's a level of confidence I don't know. Same, same. Level of confidence I may never know. You know what? I'll just finish this first and then you can tell me what you think. (laughs) Yeah, I'll just do the whole thing. It's it's such an interesting thing to consider when all of these creative processes are so different and all of the minds that create them are so different. Mm -hmm. And that just happened to be what worked for James Horner. Wow. As much of a feat as it was, Balto was the final animated production for Amblimation, which closed in 1997 um, when a number of its employees moved over to the newly founded DreamWorks with Jeffrey Katzenberg. Wow. uh, Whose first animated release, The Prince of Egypt, was co-directed by Simon Wells. Incredible. And they were working on that at the same time they were working on Shrek. Yeah. And we're going to have a Shrek connection, too. (laughs) We just are going to connect all the dots as we have our hangouts and conversations about Balto. The sci-fi article said that Wells credited the Amblimation team and their talents to the fact that they were overly ambitious up-and-comers who had gotten used to crafting quality material on exponentially smaller budgets and timelines. They were ambitious. Amblin. Oh. (laughs) I could not figure out what word you said. And I was like, did I have a stroke? Um, (laughs) The way you blinked at me. (laughs) Amblimation. Ambitious. Amblimicious. Amblicious. Got it. <laughs> that just sounds too much like delicious, which is why it confused me. This is one ambitious movie. <laughs> <laughs> Simon Wells said it was a movie made by a whole bunch of young <laughs> and very enthusiastic artists who kind of didn't know any better. Sure. Wells said, I didn't know we couldn't do this. Right. I think for all the budgetary limitations, I'm very proud of the way the movie ended up looking. And Christian and I know a thing or two about 
um, not only budgetary limitations, but not knowing your own limitations. I was about and to say. the magic that that can make sometimes. Yeah. If you don't know you can't do something, sometimes you can do it anyway. More often than not, honestly. Being young and stupid. That's why fortune favors the bold. <laughs> like Balto. How many platitudes do we have to convey <laughs> this one concept? Governor Bone. <laughs> woof, woof. Although it pains me to do this, listener. It really does. I think the story is best served if we do come at you with a part two where we explore some of the deviations from history that you might currently be reeling from sure. in the film, yeah, uh, where we can deep dive some of these casting choices, and when I finally, finally get to gush about my crush on Balto and how he made Jenna her own display of the Northern Lights, <laughs> and it was romance for me as a child. It was just the peak of what I imagine romance to be. Sure. And we just, we're going to get to talk about it next time. We will. And we'll I talk really can't it. wait to do so. There's just so much that went into this movie that I've just, you know that it's there. When you see a film like this, you know that it has this richness about it. Sure. But I really didn't, again, know what I was getting myself into when I, I undertook the Balto uh, episodes. But I think, at least personally, I've enjoyed learning the real history and what went into it. And I hope, listener, <laughs> that you do as well. And maybe you'll take the time or have an opportunity to rewatch Balto and um, kind of see those, the lines between fiction and reality blur a little bit. Well, I've sure enjoyed this. This is fun. Me too. Thanks. Wow. What a great start to the series. What a great start to 2024. Beginnings all over the place. We're just beginning this mush mushy journey <laughs> M mushy mm. i don't know mushy mushy we do have a patron we need to thank i apologize if we missed anybody if we did please call us out in our months of confusion yeah it's been a while but thank you so much to mia m thanks mia. for subscribing to our patreon happy to have you um we appreciate you and all of our other lovely patrons over there on uh patreon.com slash tpd podcast that's right and uh i'm still about to finish up the ghost stories i've been doing i still have two more to go but wow. uh, you know what? you're just making it last you're squeezing out every, i don't want to be done every last drop of ghostiness that you can yeah well the thing is there are so many more of these southern ghost story collections that i could continue for a while if people like it I don't know. Hey guys, do. do you like it? I mean, I've <laughs> had fun. Let us know. If you're a patron, let us know what you think and how you feel. We've been getting good feedback, but... I've had fun doing it. I think it's a good time. Yeah. And it's fun to stay connected with you guys um, with for similar sure, interests sure. to us. Absolutely. Well, good to be back on track. Back, back on I was going to say back in the saddle. Back on the sled. Back on the sled with all of our puppies, our good pups. <laughs> we'll be back in two weeks, part two. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, not too long after with uh, the hangout. Yeah, with David Stephen Coe, which I'm excited about. Again, I can't wait mm -hmm. for them to come tell me everything, all of my misconceptions, and they can right my wrongs. Literally, right. And wrong my rights. Exactly. <laughs> I'm excited to hear what they brought to it after the fact. I'm sure they brought a lot of that humor, a lot of the wit, the comedy. Mm -hmm. I could I feel hear like a lot David. Of, I could hear David's voice in it, too. And a lot sure. of it, yeah. And I think yeah. a lot of the side characters and their contributions, I think, for that comedy and the humor and, and uh, yeah. those elements, I think those were probably the least fleshed out when they came on board. Probably. And I can tell that they live inside all of that. So Absolutely. we're going to have a good time talking about that, too. I can't wait. Um, if you guys want to follow us on social media, we're at, you know, that's pretty dark podcast on most things. That's pretty dark that's podcast pretty dark on, on Instagram. TikTok. That's pretty dark on TikTok. You yeah, you can reach out. Um, I need to respond to a bunch of emails. So if I haven't responded Notice to that. you, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can write to us at that's pretty dark podcast at gmail.com. We will respond. We will get to it. When? That's know, more. That's the bigger it's a question. Mystery. It's a fun, exciting twisty turny mystery for everybody not just you it's nice to have a little bit of mystery mm -hmm. in life we can spice. all use some, some spice little mm, little uh, delicious little am amblicious <laughs> so glad to be back <laughs> <laughs> i am too so glad, glad to talk nonsense into a microphone again it's been it great feels, it feels big it feels important and i'm glad to be here with all of you me as well talking about a movie that i've loved since before i can remember honestly well until next time y'all Enjoy the new year. Thank you again for being here. Thanks for listening and stay warm. Don't be going out in any blizzards. What is it? Only like 70 something days until the sun sets at 7 p.m. again oh, or whatever. I can't wait. 
I don't want the heat, but the darkness really gets me. Been bothering me. What is 2024 going to do to us? I don't know. We don't yet know. I didn't know what 23 was going to do to us. <laughs> me neither. So Actually, sure that's a good point. I'm still not past I that sure yet. I sure don't so. know what 24 is going to bring. We'll see. Looking forward to it. Well, all right. Bye now. Bye, guys. Thanks for listening to That's Pretty Dark. Written and produced by Christian Baxter Mott and Kaylin Andrews. Our music is composed by Jonathan Simmons, and our art is provided by Paige Garland at Power Girl Illustration. Join the collective nostalgia and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at That's Pretty Dark Podcast. Share your experiences and let us know what shows, films, or villains still haunt you from childhood at That's Pretty Dark Podcast at gmail.com. Remember, you're never really alone. So, until next time. Sweet dreams, everyone. <laughs>